We have a real treat for you this evening, Dr. Neil Postman. Neil Postman has achieved international recognition as an expert in semantics and communication theory. He's chair of the Department of Culture and Communication at NYU School of Education, and for 11 years served as editor of Etc. He's a contributing editor to The Nation. A native of Brooklyn, Professor Postman began his career as an elementary school teacher and then a high school teacher, and he moved on to the university. As a professor at New York University in English education, he established an esteemed reputation in linguistics and semantics. Prior to becoming New York University chair, he taught the history of technology and its social effects. He founded the graduate program of media ecology at New York University. Dr. Simon is the recipient of the George Orwell Award for Clarity in Language and the Distinguished Professor Award at New York University. He has authored 18 books. Among them are the 1960s classic Amusing Ourselves to Death, his most recent book, The End of Education, and tonight's topic, Technology, the Surrender of Culture to Technology. Through the years, Neil Postman has spent endless hours researching the social consequences of television, and he says this is what has made him a skeptic of technological progress. In a spring 1996 issue of Social Policy, Professor Postman said, quote, 20 years ago, no one would have been interested in this kind of discussion. Now you can really draw a crowd. There's an audience out there waiting to be organized to exercise pressure in making sure that we think a little more clearly on these matters. People have begun to sense that there's something really not quite right about making all your aspirations related to bigger and better technology. As predicted, there's an audience out here eager to hear what Neil Postman has to say. Six weeks ago, we were totally sold out to standing room only. I bought my ticket in August to make sure that I'd have a seat. And I can't wait any longer to hear what he has to say. So please join me in a warm welcome for the distinguished and controversial Dr. Neil Postman. Tucky said to me about 10 minutes ago, what would you do if I referred to you as Neil Simon? <laughs> she said, would you, would you uh, lose your mind over it? But she did, did you notice that? <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much uh, for coming. Uh, I feel uh, pretty confident in assuming that those of you here in Illinois, like the rest of us in America, are deeply concerned about the, the fact that in less than four years we will arrive at a new millennium. There's a great deal of talk about the 21st century and how it will pose for us unique problems of which we know very little but for which nonetheless we are supposed to carefully prepare. Everyone worries about this. Uh, business people, educators, politicians, theologians, and all the rest. So I should like to begin by putting uh, your minds at ease. I doubt that the 21st century will pose problems for us that are more stunning, disorienting, or complex than those we faced in this century, or the 19th, 18th, 17th, or for that matter, many of the centuries before that. Uh, but if you are excessively nervous about the new millennium, I can give you right at the start some good advice about how to confront it. And the advice comes from people whom we can trust and whose thoughtfulness uh, it's safe to say, 
exceeds that of President Clinton, uh, Newt Gingrich, or even Bill Gates. Here's what Henry David Thoreau said. All our inventions are but improved means to an unimproved end. Here's what Goethe told us. One should each day try to hear a little song, read a good poem, see a fine picture, and if it is possible, speak a few reasonable words. Here's what Socrates told us, the unexamined life is not worth living. And here is what Rabbi Hillel told us, what is hateful to thee, do not do to another. Here's what the prophet Micah told us, what does the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. And I could tell you if, if I had the time, although you know it well enough, what Confucius, Isaiah, Jesus, Mohammed, the Buddha, Spinoza, and Shakespeare told us, it's all the same. There is no escaping from ourselves. The human dilemma is as it has always been, and we will solve nothing by cloaking ourselves in technological glory. To put it plainly, I suspect that the wisdom of the ages and the sages will be just as relevant in the 21st century as it was in any other. Nonetheless, having said all this, I know perfectly well that because we live now in what everyone calls a technological society, we have some special problems that Jesus Hillel, Socrates, and Micah did not and could not speak of. Now I've chosen to address these problems by posing a series of questions about them. What I intend to do is to offer seven questions about technology, the answers to which can provide insights into the ways technology intrudes itself into a culture and therefore affects our social institutions. The answers to the questions are important, although they will vary according to the answerer. But the questions are more important. Answers change over time and in different circumstances even for the same person. The questions endure, which, I, uh, which is why I think of them as a kind of permanent armament with which citizens can protect themselves against being overwhelmed by technology. Now, before presenting the questions, I need to make two points, one of which I hope will clarify what I will be saying and the other why I am saying it. The first is, that I make a distinction between a technology and a medium. As I see it, a technology is to a medium as the brain is to the mind. Like the brain, a technology is a physical apparatus. Like the mind, a medium is a use to which a physical apparatus is put. A technology becomes a medium as it is given a place in a particular social setting as it insinuates itself into economic and political contexts. A technology, in other words, is merely a machine, a piece of hard wiring. A medium is a social creation. Now it's useful, I think, to make this distinction because with it in mind, we can more easily understand that how a technology is used by any particular culture is not necessarily the only way it could be used. For example, if we try, uh, if we try to answer the question, how does television affect our politics, we have to understand that we're not talking about television as a technology, 
but television as a medium. There are many places in the world where television, although the same technology as it is in America, is an entirely different medium from that which we know. I refer to places where the majority of people do not have television sets, or where only one station is available, or where television doesn't operate around the clock, or where most programs have as their purpose the direct furtherance of government policy, or where commercials are unknown. In such places, television will not have the same meaning or power as it does in America, uh, which is to say it is possible for a technology to be used so that its social, economic, and political consequences are quite different from one culture to another. Now, of course, like the brain itself, every technology has an inherent bias, has both unique technical limitations and possibilities. That is to say, every technology has embedded in its physical form a predisposition toward being used in certain ways and not others. Only those who know nothing of the history of technology believe that a technology is entirely neutral or adaptable. In fact, there's an old joke that mocks such a naive belief. Uh, belief. Uh, Thomas Edison, the joke goes, uh, would have revealed his discovery of the electric light much sooner than he did, except for the fact that every time he turned it on, he held it to his mouth and said, hello, hello. <laughs> well, uh, you can't use an electric light to speak to your mother in Chicago and you can't use a telephone to illuminate a page in a book. In other words, each technology has an agenda of its own and, so to speak, gives us instructions on how to fulfill its own technical destiny. We have to understand that fact, but we must not, and especially we must not underestimate it. Of course, we need not be tyrannized by it. We do not always have to go in exactly the direction that a technology leads us toward going. We have obligations to ourselves that may supersede our obligations to any technology. Now, having said all this, in my remarks this evening, I will for the most part uh, probably use the terms technology and media nearly interchangeably because we are having this meeting in America for Americans and we're all familiar with the uses we make of our various technologies. Nonetheless, I hope you'll keep the distinction between these two words in mind because there are circumstances where it is thoughtless and even misleading to use them as synonyms. Now to my second prefatory point, which concerns my own attitude toward technology. I think I have to tell you that I do not have email or voicemail or call waiting. I do not use a word processor. I've written 18 books with a pad and a yellow pen. Uh, 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 <laughs> that was Neil Simon speaking. <laughs> well, I guess I, I, I'll have to show you then. I don't know if you know what this is. It's, it's user-friendly, it's very inexpensive. And I use this and a yellow pad. I have no interest in the internet. And I do not regard Bill Gates as a genius. Now, I have good reasons for each of these deficiencies. And if you're interested, I would be happy to give them when I am done. Nonetheless, because of them, I have a reputation as being anti-technology. 
in fact, as being something of a neo-Luddite. <laughs> now, people who have labeled me as such usually know nothing about, about the Luddites. Because if they did, they wouldn't use the term unless they meant to compliment me. In any case, let me assure you that I regard it as stupid to be anti-technology. That would be something like being anti-food. We need technology to live as we need food to live. But of course, if we eat too much food, or eat food that has no nutritional value, or eat food that is infected with disease, we turn a means of survival into its opposite. The same might be said of the ways in which we use technology. It can be used as life enhancing, and it can be used as life diminishing, which means it is stupid to be categorically anti-technology, but certainly not stupid to be deeply suspicious of technology, for it is clear that technologies and the media they become can have the most serious effects on our ways of living, on our social institutions, on our psychic habits, and on our ways of experiencing the world. Therefore, it seems to me that only a fool would blithely welcome any technology without having given serious thought not only to what technology will do, but also to what it will undo. Well, enough of prologue. I'd like to turn to my questions. Question one needs to be addressed when anyone tells us about a new technology. For example, interactive television, virtual reality, the information superhighway, or whatever. Here's the question. What is the problem to which this technology is a solution? Now this question needs to be asked because there are technologies that are not solutions to any problem that a normal person would regard as significant. Although Vice President Gore is certainly a normal person, I am skeptical of the reasons even he gives for us spending billions of dollars to create an information superhighway. He says repeatedly that the highway will provide each of us with access to 500 or perhaps even 1,000 television stations. I am therefore obliged to ask, <laughs> is this a problem that most of us yearn to have solved? Indeed, need to have solved. Do we believe that having access to 40 or 50 stations, as many of us now do, is inadequate, and that we cannot achieve a fulfilled life unless we have a 1,000 stations to choose from? What exactly is the problem to be solved here? If one were to say, well, the fundamental problem is how to get more information to more people faster and in more diverse forms, could we not say that this was the problem humanity faced in the early 19th century? and that beginning in the 1840s with the invention of telegraphy and photography, we addressed this problem. And for 140 years afterwards, we continued to address it. And that we have solved the problem, in fact, in a spectacular fashion. And that it is both reactionary and distracting to pretend that we have not solved the problem and wasteful to spend billions of dollars in the 21st century on solving a 19th century problem that we already solved. <laughs> well, that's just my answer. <laughs> Yours might be different, that's fine. But the point is that the question needs to be asked. 
and we uh, certainly are entitled to ask it with a measure of skepticism. A couple of years ago, I went to buy um, a Honda Accord. The salesman said, uh, proudly, I thought, that it had cruise control, for which there's an extra charge. So I asked him, what is the problem to which cruise control <laughs> is the solution? Well, he said no, no one had ever asked him this before. <laughs> um, but he, he thought about it for a few seconds, and then he said, it's the problem of keeping your foot on the gas. <laughs> well, I told him that I'd been driving for 35 years, and I'd never found this to be a problem. <laughs> he then said, this car has electric windows. <laughs> so you know what I asked him, right? <laughs> and he was ready for me this time. He said, it's the problem of having to go like this, <laughs> or... <laughs> so I said, well, look, I'm, uh, uh, I, I've never really found this to be a problem, but I, I'm an academic, I, I live a, a, a sort of sedate life, and whatever little exercise I can get is on. I, I, bought, I bought the uh, uh, Accord because you cannot, uh, and I bought it with cruise control and the electric windows, because you cannot get this car without cruise control and electric windows, which is a, something to think about because there are many people um, uh, who think that new technology always increases people's options. Sometimes it does, but not always. For example, if you want a car without cruise control and electric windows. But another good example, a uh, more cultural example, of when the skepticism of this kind was uh, applied concerns a question raised some years ago as to whether or not our government should subsidize the manufacture of a supersonic jet. Both the British and the French uh, had already built SSTs, and a serious debate uh, ensued in the halls of Congress and elsewhere as to whether or not Americans should have one of our own. And so the question was asked. It actually was. What is the problem to which the supersonic jet is the solution? The answer, it turned out, was that it takes six hours to go from New York to LA in a 747. With a supersonic jet, it can be done in three. Most Americans, I'm happy to say, did not think that that was a sufficiently serious problem to warrant such a heavy investment. Besides, a lot of Americans asked, what would we do with the three hours we saved? <laughs> and their answer was, we probably would watch television. <laughs> and so the suggestion was made that we put television sets on the 747 <laughs> and thereby save billions of dollars. <laughs> now, in addition to this, another question was asked, which I now put forward as my second question. After one has answered the question, what is the problem to which a particular technology is the solution, one must ask, whose problem is it? In the case of the SST, the problem of getting to LA or London faster than 747s could do it was largely a problem for movie stars, rock musicians, and corporate executives. Hardly a problem that most Americans would regard as worth solving if it would cost them a lot of money. But this question, whose problem is it, needs to be applied to any technologies. Most technologies do solve some problem, 
But the problem may not be everybody's problem or even most people's problem. We need to be very careful in determining who will benefit from a technology and who will pay for it. They are not always the same people. But let's say that we found a technological solution to a problem that most people do have. We now come to the third question. It's this. Suppose we solve this problem and solve it decisively. What new problems might be created because we have solved the problem? The automobile solved some very important problems for most people, but in doing so has poisoned our air, has choked our cities with traffic, and has contributed towards the destruction of some of the beauty of our natura natural landscape. Antibiotics have certainly solved significant problems for almost all people, but in doing so have resulted in the weakening of what we call our immune systems. Television has solved several important problems, but in solving them has changed the nature of political discourse, has led to a serious decline in literacy, and has even made the traditional process of socializing children difficult, if not impossible. It's doubtful that you can think of any important single technology that did not generate new problems as a result of its having solved an old problem. Of course, it's sometimes very difficult to know what new problems will arise as a result of a technological solution. Benedictine monks invented the mechanical clock in the 13th century in order to be more precise in performing their canonical prayers, which they needed to say seven times a day. Had they known that the mechanical clock would eventually be used by merchants as a means of establishing a standardized workday and then a standardized product, that is that the clock would be used as an instrument for making money instead of serving God, the monks might have decided that their sundials was quite sufficient. Had Gutenberg foreseen that his printing press with movable type would lead to the breakup of the Holy Roman See, he surely would have used his old wine press to make wine and not books. Well, in the 13th century, maybe it didn't matter so much if people lacked technological vision. Maybe not even in the 15th century. But in a technological society, I don't think we can afford any longer to move into the future with our eyes tightly closed. We need to speculate in an open-eyed way about negative possibilities. But as I've said, it's no easy matter to know what sort of problems a new technology will generate. Well, anyway, it's not sufficient to reflect in a general way on the possible costs. In order to give some focus to our reflections, we have to ask a fourth question. Which people and what institutions might be most seriously harmed by a technological solution. This was the question, by the way, that gave rise to the Luddite movement in England during the years 1811 and 1818. The people we call Luddites were skilled manual workers in the garment industry at the time when mechanization was taking command and the factory system was being put into place. They knew perfectly well what advantages mechanization would bring to most people. But they also saw with equal clarity how it would bring ruin 
to their own ways of life, especially to their children, who were being employed as virtual slave laborers in factories. So they resisted technological change by the simplistic and useless expedient of smashing to bits industrial machinery, which they continued to do until they were imprisoned or killed by the British Army. Now, no one knows for sure where the word Luddite uh, came from, but the word has come to mean a person who resists technological change in any way, and it's usually used as an insult. Now, why this is so is a bit puzzling, because, as I said before, only a fool doesn't know that new technologies always produce winners and losers. And there is nothing irrational about loser resistance. Now, Bill Gates, who is, of course, a winner, knows this. And because he's no fool, his propaganda continuously implies that computer technology can bring harm to no one. Well, that is the way of winners. They want losers to be grateful and enthusiastic, and especially to be unaware that they are losers. <laughs> Let's take school teachers as an example of losers who are deluded into thinking they are winners. There must be some school teachers in the audience. <laughs> Listen to this. In America, well, let me just stop for a moment and just tell you a fact, which I didn't include here, but uh, which haunts me. Last um, fall, 1,100,000 children showed up in the New York City school system. There were no seats. You hear what I'm saying? There were no seats for 91,000 children. So they met in latrines, in the bathrooms. This is where their classes were held. The chancellor of the New York City schools is mostly interested in spending a lot of money to wire the classrooms. That's all I'm going to say. Just think about that. Well, um, uh, New York is not the only place like this. Throughout the country, we're preparing to spend in the aggregate billions of dollars to wire schools in order to accommodate a computer technology and for reasons uh, that are by no means clear. There certainly does not exist any compelling evidence that personal computers or any other manifestation of computer technology can do for children what good, well-paid, underburdened teachers can do. Where, then, is the outcry from teachers? They are losers in this deal, and serious losers. Here, for example, is an announcement of a recent insult to teachers taken from the June 11, 1996 edition of the Washington Post. I quote, quote, Governor Paris Glendening, Governor of Maryland, announced yesterday that the state of Maryland plans to connect every public school to the internet this year, part of a $53 million effort to give students greater access to far-flung information via computer. Just, I'm still quoting, despite mixed reviews, by national analysts who have studied computer use in schools, the plan calls for each of Maryland's 1,262 public schools to have at least two computer term uh, terminals linked to the internet before winter, and for every classroom to have three to five such terminals within five years." Unquote. Now, Governor Clendenning calls this a bold and big initiative and expects tens of millions of additional dollars 
to be donated by private enterprise so that the total expenditure will be close this year to $100 million. Here is the governor's justification, and again, I quote, accessing information is the first vital step in understanding and ultimately improving the world we live in, unquote. Now, let us put aside the fact that at best, this is a problematic claim. And at worst, it is errant nonsense. Let us also put aside the fact that even if the governor's claim is true, American students already have an oversupply of sources of information. There are in America 17,000 newspapers, 12,000 periodicals, 27,000 video outlets for renting tapes, 500 million TV sets, well over 600 million radios, not inclu including those in automobiles. There are 10,000 libraries and 40,000 new book titles published every year. Each day in America, 41 million photographs are taken. Now, do American students now require an additional $100 million investment to ensure that they become well-informed citizens? Putting all of that aside, will you agree with me that the following hypothetical statement, which I've just made up, I mean, not just now, but would be happier news and more rational for both teachers and students. This is my quote. The state of Maryland intends to spend $100 million to increase the number of teachers in the state, to pay those we have more, and to reduce teaching loads. Governor Clendenning said this is a vital step toward assuring that our students will be given a more attentive, wholesome and creative education, unquote. Now, I should think most teachers would support such an investment, but we hear very little from them on that score. In fact, many teachers are thrilled by the thought of a hundred million dollar investment in computer terminals. Bill Gates loves this form of stupidity. Here's a fifth question. What changes in language are being enforced by new technologies? What is being gained and what is being lost by such changes? Now, you will agree that no matter what new media come into our lives, language will remain our most indispensable medium. And it is always a serious matter when new meanings arise and old ones are lost. Think, for example, of how the words community and conversation are now employed by those who use the internet. The word community has traditionally referred to those who have different and even opposing interests, but who find common ground for the sake of political or social harmony. Internet communities are strangers to this conception. They begin in harmony and make no demands on one's capacity for negotiation and tolerance, which is the essence of how communities are formed and sustained. As for conversations, two people who are typing messages to each other are not, in my opinion, having a conversation. <laughs> in that the most significant aspects of face-to-face -face communication are simply absent. Now those who come to believe that emailing is conversation are likely to be people who believe that there is no significant difference between speaking one's sadness face to face to a friend who has lost her mother 
and sending her a Hallmark condolence card. Think of how television has changed the meaning of the phrase political debate. Would Abraham Lincoln or Stephen Douglas recognize such a televised event as a debate? When Lincoln and Douglas were going through Illinois in their debates, they had more than seven, by the way, uh, typically Lincoln would speak for three hours, Douglas would speak for three hours, and then Lincoln would have one hour for rebuttal. Then when they went to Ottawa or Springfield or the next a town, then Douglas would speak for three hours, Lincoln for three hours, and Douglas would have an hour for a bottle. Here's a debate in America today. Barbara Walters or some mistress of ceremony says, um, the question is, this is for you, President Bush. What is the problem in the Middle East and how can it be solved? You will have two minutes to answer, <laughs> after which Governor Clinton will have one minute to reply. Actually, I think it's a form of mental illness because uh, one would expect, wouldn't one, that President Bush or Governor Clinton would object and say, how dare you ask such a question and give one of us two minutes to answer and the other one minute to rebut. We're running for the most serious political office perhaps in the world. What is wrong with you? <laughs> but of course they don't say this. Or they might say, how dare you ask such a question? What kind of people do you think Americans are that they would put up with this? Well, they don't say that either, because we know what kind of people we are. <laughs> um, nonetheless, people do say the next day, did you see the debate? I often imagine what Lincoln or Douglas would if they could come back and to hear us use that word that way. Think of what's happening to the word public or the phrase participatory democracy. Not long ago I reviewed a book called The Electronic Republic for the LA Times. The author argued that new technologies will make representative democracy obsolete because the technologies will make it possible to have instant plebiscites on every issue. In this way, voters will directly decide if we should join NAFTA or send troops to Bosnia or impeach the president. The Senate and House of Representatives will be largely unnecessary. And this, the author said, is participatory democracy just as it was in Athens in the 15th century BC, the 5th century BC. Now, I have no objection uh, to borrowing, borrowing a phrase from an older media environment in order to conceptualize a new development. We do it all the time, but it has its risks, and attention must be paid when we do it. To call a train an iron horse, as we once did, may be picturesque, but it obscures the most significant differences between a train and a horse and buggy. To use the term an electronic town hall meeting similarly, uh, similarly obscures the differences between an 18th century face-to-face -face gathering of citizens and a packaged televised pseudo-event. To use the term distance learning to refer to students and a teacher sending email messages to each other may have some value, but it obscures the fact 
that the act of reading a book is the best example of distance learning ever invented because reading not only triumphs over the limitations of space and co-presence, but of time as well. And as for participatory democracy, we would be hard pressed to find any similarity, whatever, between politics as practiced by 5,000 homogeneous, well-educated, slave-holding Athenians and 250 million Americans doing plebiscites every week, and it's dangerous to allow language to lead us to believe otherwise. Now, I'm not saying, by the way, that citizens uh, ought to be urged to resist language change, only that they need to be aware of how it occurs and why and what sort of attitudes the new uses of language promotes. Here's a sixth question. And you'll recognize that it's uh, related to some of the others, but I give it a special status because of its importance. The question is this. What sort of people and institutions acquire special economic and political power because of technological change? Now this question needs to be asked because the transformation of a technology into a medium always results in a realignment of economic and political power. And I don't say this as a criticism of anyone, but simply as a fact. A new medium creates new jobs and makes old ones obsolete. A new medium gives prominence to certain kinds of skills and subordinates others. Ronald Reagan, for example, could not have been president were it not for television. This is a man who rarely spoke precisely and never eloquently, and yet he was called the great communicator. Why? Because he was magic on television. His, telev his televised image projected a sense of authenticity, tradition, intimacy, and caring. And it didn't much matter if citizens agreed with what he said or even understood what he said. Television gives power to some while it deprives others. And this is true of every important medium. And this fact has always been understood by intelligent entrepreneurs who see opportunities emerging from the creation of new media. That's why media entrepreneurs are the most radical force in culture. I don't know why they, they're called conservatives. Maybe because they wear dark suits and gray ties. These entrepreneurs are interested in maximizing the profits of new media and do not give much thought to large-scale cultural effects. America's greatest radicals have been our entrepreneurs. Morse, Bell, Edison, Sarnoff, Disney. These men created the 20th century as Bill Gates and others are creating the 21st. Now, I don't know if much can be done to moderate the cultural changes that media entrepreneurs will enforce, but citizens ought to know what is happening and keep an attentive and critical eye on such people. Here's the final and seventh question. And for it, I return to a point I made in my lengthy prologue. The question is this. What alternative uses might be made of a technology? The one proceeds here by assuming that any medium we have created is not necessarily the only one we might make of a particular technology. In America, it was not inevitable, for example, that television should be turned over to commercial industries. As for radio, in 1926, Herbert Hoover, who was then Secretary of Commerce and two years later, President of the United States, 
delivered an address in which he said that it was unthinkable to use radio as a commercial medium. It was obvious to him, as it is no longer to many of us, that radio was the greatest medium yet invented for providing a general education to the masses. Well, it hasn't turned out that way. But the point I wish to make is that how technology is transformed into a particular kind of medium is a complex and even fascinating subject. It's a subject filled with politics, sociology, with the psychology of good intentions, and of course, lots of greed. Well, there are many other questions I could suggest, but for now, I, I'm going to stick with these seven. What is the problem to which a technology claims to be the solution? Whose problem is it? What new problems will be created because of solving an old one? Which people and institutions will be most harmed? What changes in language are being promoted? What shifts in economic and political power are likely to result? And finally, what alternative media might be made from a technology? Now, there does remain one other question I should mention, but it's not about media, it's about ourselves. And I refer to the matter of where and how our citizens will learn to ask relevant questions about media. And this would have to be, of course, the subject of an entirely different talk, but I would like to conclude by saying that I think this task inevitably must be assigned to our schools. Our schools have been blithely and I should say irresponsibly indifferent to the study of the ways in which media alter our social relations, psychic habits, and political processes. Most school administrators and politicians think that they are responding to technological change by wiring our classrooms. What is needed, of course, is for our students to have their heads unwired. And I have a measure of confidence in saying that that process might begin with these seven questions. Perhaps I've, I have too much faith, as many Americans do, in the power of education. But I can think of no other institution that is more available to preparing our young for what is ahead. And if we educate them properly, then I think we can face the new millennium with confidence and some hope. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Dr. Postman. And he has kindly agreed to answer some questions uh, from the audience. <clears throat> but before he does that, I'd like to uh, announce the last uh, event in our lecture series for this academic year. Uh, right here on April 29th, we will have the great gender debate between Dr. Sarah Weddington and Phyllis Shafley, and you need to get your tickets early, same time, same place. Now, if you will, if you have a question, if you'll raise your hand, speak loudly, and, and make it as short and concise as you can, Dr. Postman has agreed to uh, respond to them. Yeah. Way in the back. Where, where are you? Oh, okay. Could, could you speak a, could you speak a little louder? Well, I mean, you, you're talking about me. <laughs> uh, uh, 
Well, I think he was a asking, uh, uh, he, he was referring to himself, but I think he was just being polite. And, uh, yeah. uh, he's saying there are people, well, like him <laughs> and me, who, who don't fit in with the new technological world, right? Okay, you could sit down. Uh, the question is, what happens to those of us who don't uh, fit in to the new technological ethos? What's going to happen to us? I, I don't know what's going to happen to us. Uh, um, I, I might say that here's how I handle it. Um, as I said in my talk, I, I don't consider myself anti-technology. But I, I do think I'm uh, entitled to pose these sorts of questions, even in a personal, a personal case. I mean, I, I don't have, uh, well, first of all, I think, do you know what call waiting is? Is there anyone here who agrees with me that this is the rudest, most disgusting invention? Well, uh, uh, there, it, it, it's conceivable that someone who is in business uh, and finds that it's necessary to have it might think it disgusting and then have it anyway. But in my life, since I think it is a disgusting thing, I just don't have it. Uh, I don't use email because uh, I have no need for it. By the way, <laughs> Uh, here's one way one handles this. When I finished my last book, by the way, actually I've written 20 books. I, I have to talk to Tucky about this. She, uh, I, I finished the last book, uh, which was called The End of Education. I called up my public, uh, the editor at Knopf and said, Jonathan, I have good news. I finished the book. And he said, great send me the disc. <laughs> I said, excuse me? Well, what I did, what I had to do was actually hire someone to take what I had written to put it on the word processor and send it off. Uh, so one has to make concessions. One has to accommodate that world. I did buy the Honda Accord. I've never used the cruise control. Uh, and on principle, I won't use the cruise control. <laughs> of course, with the electric windows, you know, what can you do? Uh, uh, so uh, it's a negotiation that you have to engage in with the world. But I, I've just written a piece for a, an internal journal at NYU uh, in which uh, uh, the first class I took, I've been at NYU for five decades. Can you believe that? My first class was February 1959. So I was there at the 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. And in, in those days, I mean, we, our technologies were, in quotes, primitive. <laughs> Students could read, they could write, and they could talk. They wrote pretty much the way I write my books. Uh, some of them used a typewriter, but that was not required. Uh, now, of course, NYU is a high-tech place. So I addressed the question, are the kids smarter than they used to be, and are the professors smarter than they used to be? And my answer is no. I mean, in fact, I think we've even lost a little uh, because professors now spend a lot of time talking about the, the technologies they use to communicate. I mean, years ago, what could you say if, you, if everyone wrote with a pen and a pad? What can you say about this? That the, my pen has run out of ink. Uh, how, how interesting is that? I, I do remember a discussion uh, as to whether a yellow pad or white pad is better to use, but it, it was, didn't last long and it, it was indecisive. And that was it. 
all the conversations people had were about ideas. Now I notice a lot of professors spend a lot of their time talking about the media they use to communicate. So I think there's been a slight loss. But um, uh, my general answer is that you have to negotiate with this new world, use those technologies that are in fact useful to you, and do not use those technologies for which you have no great use. So that's how I fight it. It's probably a losing battle, because uh, Americans love, uh, you know, they, they lust for technology. Uh, I don't know why that is, but um, de Tocqueville says in uh, Democracy in America, Americans have a lust for the new. That's probably true. As a matter of fact, I sometimes think, suppose the year were 1907, but we knew what we know now about the automobile. And someone said, let's make a list of all the good things it will bring and another list of all the bad things. Be a pretty long list here, but also a pretty long list here. Now let's have a plebiscite. Should we do it? Our air is going to be poisoned. Cancer rates are going to go up. You know, cities are going to be jammed with traffic. Let's vote. I think Americans would say, oh shit, let's do it. <laughs> don't, don't you think? They probably would say, let's do it. But, but I think, I think someone would likely have said, in 1907, yeah, let's do it, but is there anything we can do to maximize the advantages <clears throat> and uh, minimize the disadvantages? Good question. In 1907, there would have been plenty we could have done then, and maybe in 1927 and 47, in 1997, it's pointless. We don't use the automobile, it uses us. So here's how smart I am. Make you feel bad about coming to hear me talk. <laughs> I thought television was going to be the last great technology that Americans would be stupid about, <laughs> would accept without asking any questions. I mean, if someone had said in 1946 to Americans, look, this is a nice machine here, but by 1997, this is going to be the deal. The average American kid will clock 5,000 hours in front of the TV set before entering the first grade. 19,000 hours by high school's end. By age 21, we'll have seen 650,000 television commercials. American politics will be reduced to a 30-second commercial during campaigns and sound bites the rest of the time. I mean, if someone had said this, what would we have said? Oh shit, let's do it anyway? I thought, well, we didn't know in 1946. We were not really responsible. But we learned that. So I said, well, that's it. Now what's happening with the computer? The same blindness. No one is asking anything worth asking. And we're lined up to spend billions to wire our classrooms. Why, for God's sakes? I'm not saying we shouldn't, but is there a serious discussion about this? So, I, I'm getting overwrought here, you think? <laughs> um, another question. Yes, sir? I think that you're crazy. <laughs> there, what, what's he saying?
Yes. Well, I mean, uh, keep pace with what? <laughs> uh, my, uh, uh, if we're talking about developing uh, in, our, in our young children uh, communication competencies, then I would say the first order of business, uh, besides obviously speech, <laughs> uh, which we really don't have to teach them because we're genetically programmed to learn that, the first item of business would be to make sure they're good readers. Uh, here, see, here's what I would say to a parent. How is it that all the people who invented these new technologies, television, laser beams, computers, how is it those people were educated exclusively with this and a pad and a book? I mean, how did that happen? How, how, did those, how did those people get so smart that just working with this and a pad and a book, they were able to invent this high-tech world? Now, I'm not, um, uh, I mean, I have a son who's uh, an astrophysicist in the Hubble uh, Telescope Project. By the way, in 1999, they're sending up some more astronauts, you know, to mess around up there. And my son, he, he's going to give them directions. <laughs> now, you want to know something terrifying when you're, to think that your son, who didn't even know how to tie his shoes till he was like six, <laughs> is giving astronauts directions in outer space. Anyway, uh, he tells me that through computer technology, uh, they can solve problems in, uh, in uh, a day and a half that would have taken months, with, uh, maybe even longer than that, without uh, computers. And I have, I'm, I'm sure that's true, and um, I, I have no uh, doubt that um, uh, the advantages of uh, computer technology for uh, high-level research in the hard sciences and the advantages of computer technology for um, uh, large-scale corporations and institutions like the IRS and the, the Pentagon and General Motors and so on, that's a great advantage there. Uh, it's not clear to me that uh, uh, a real slick uh, competence in using uh, computer technology is much of an advantage to the average person. It, the case has not been made. I mean, if someone would make the case, uh, I assure you I would accept it. But no one has been able to make that case. So I, I'm not in a hurry in raising children to make sure they're terribly scared. But besides, it's not a problem anyway. Why are we even talking about this? 35 million Americans have already learned how to use computers without any help whatsoever from the schools. If the schools do absolutely nothing in the next 10 years, everyone's going to know how to use computers. Now, suppose I'm right in saying that. The question still remains, what should we do with kids in school? What communication skills would we, ought we to promote and, and uh, try to cultivate? In my own case, uh, I mean, I have three kids, and uh, the main thing we wanted to make sure was that um, they knew how to read, they knew how to write, and they knew how to speak. And I told them when they asked what they should major in in college, I said, it doesn't matter. Pick something that you're terribly interested in because you already know how to write, read, and speak. Therefore, anything you want to do after that, in America, be a piece of cake. Because most people don't read, write, and speak. 
right? So if you want to go to professional school, they'll take you in a, in a jiffy. If you want to go to, to corporate America, they'll take you even faster. Uh, so one of them majored in uh, music. Uh, well, the astrophysicist, you know, he majored in physics, of course. Uh, but, uh, and then my daughter is, is a teacher. She majored in uh, dramatic literature because she was interested in it. But that, that would, if, if anyone asked me, as you did, uh, well, what would be the most important thing so far as helping children cultivate c uh, communication skills? I would say it's that. Uh, in fact, I sometimes wonder, this is just an aside, and you must promise not to tell anyone. About this. <laughs> I sometimes wonder if there isn't a sort of conspiracy going on. This is the conspiracy. The people who are going to run everything in America, now and in the foreseeable future, are those people who read, write, and speak. Those are the people who get into Yale and Princeton and Harvard by demonstrating, not that they have computer skills, but that they can read, write, and speak. The rest of the hoi polloi is going to be messing around with film, I mean, it's not just computer, the multimedia, the great unwashed are going to be experts in the multimedia. Meanwhile, the guys and gals running everything will be those who have demonstrated a command over language. That's my best answer. There's, yes, sir. Good, good. <laughs> are you buying these books? Well, I mean, you, you, uh, <laughs> I, I can't answer this question, but I, but, but uh, the question uh, has embedded in it something that I feel very strongly about. It is this, that what is distracting us from solving some of the problems that you've mentioned is a kind of worldview promoted especially now by uh, computer technology, that the reason, the main reason we have problems in the world is that we have insufficient information. If only we could get more information, easier to access, and get it faster, then we could solve this problem, or any of the others you mentioned. And I think this is a, a, a an awesome conceit and uh, uh, a terrible misjudgment. Look, if there are children starving any place, it is not because we have insufficient information. If there's crime rampant in the streets in New York and Detroit and Chicago, it is not because we have insufficient information. If the ozone layer is being depleted and uh, rainforest is disappearing. It's not because we have insufficient information. And if you can't get along with your own relatives, it's not because you have insufficient information. But we have come to believe that that is the source of all the misery and pain in the world. If only we had more information. And I think that is a complete distraction. This is what Bill Gates wants us to believe. And apparently, Governor Clendenning of Maryland, and for all I know, 
uh, most uh, teachers and administrators. If only we had more If we could wire every classroom to the internet, that's it. That's how we'll get um, informed citizens. If only we could get this information superhighway so we could have 500 stations, then that's it. That's how we'll do it. Well, my view, as expressed in the talk, is that this is a very reactionary point of view. We have solved this problem already. How to get more information to more people fast and in diverse forms. We solved it. Congratulations. It was great. But we created another problem. The other problem is information glut. Information meaninglessness. Information incoherence. We are flooded in information. We are drowning in information. And talk to an educator and say, well, wh what do we have to do in schools? I know the problem. They don't have enough information. So we've got a new set of problems here in education and the social life. How do we learn, or what do we have to know to learn, what to do in a culture that is saturated with information? This has never happened before. This truly has never happened before. Because prior to the, the early 19th century, every culture suffered from information scarcity. And it was beginning in the 1840s, by the way, an NYU professor, Samuel Finley Brees Morse, uh, who's associated with the invention of the telegraph, was a professor at NYU. We didn't give him tenure. That's, no, there wasn't such a thing then. Uh, but beginning in, in the early 19th century, humanity addressed this problem, how to get more information to more people, fast and in diverse forms. In the 1840s, a message could travel only as fast as a human being could, which was 35 miles an hour, roughly, on a, on a train. So we address, how do we overcome this problem? And then, from the 1840s right through into this century, by the way, there were far more uh, technological changes in the 19th century than there have been in the 20th. Uh, I mean, I don't know if you, you know about the 19th century? <laughs> it's really interesting. Uh, but beginning then, and right into our own century, we address this problem. How, how can we overcome information scarcity? And we've done it. In doing it, we created another problem. What to do with all the information? What does it mean? Where is it, what are we going to do with it? Uh, so no one's addressing that problem. That's a really serious problem. But we're not addressing it because everyone is obsessed with this idiotic idea that Governor Clendenning had. If only, if we wired Maryland's classrooms, this is the way to create informed citizens. We have every classroom connected to the internet. Why? There are no libraries in the state. There are no, there are no uh, newspapers. Uh, everyone's flooded with information. So we've got to get off the track. I think if we said, no, this is not our problem. We don't really need more uh, access to it. We have enough. Now, let's calm down and see what are the problems we have. I mean, Clinton really, when he gave his uh, State of the Union address, did you, well, maybe you missed it, because was that the O.J. Simpson thing? <laughs> that tried, so you may have missed it. But here's the President of the United States saying, listen to this, this is the educational goal for the 21st century. This is his goal, that every classroom be connected to the internet. 
the man should be impeached just for that. <laughs> that that's, uh, now, one, one would think, one would think that the man would say, well, this will be a means to something. Fair enough. Let's wire every classroom. It's a means. To what? What is it, what is the end? Well, in the culture we live in, technological innovation does not need to be justified, does not need to be explained. It is an end in itself because most of us believe that technological innovation and human progress are exactly the same thing, which of course is not so. And um, so, I mean, we have some serious problems. However, I will end, Ed, because I know you're moving around there. I could see. Uh, so I, I will end by saying this. Uh, uh, I, if I, uh, it's obvious that uh, one correctly labels me as a critic of technology, of course. Uh, but um, I'm not a Luddite, and I do what I do and say what I say because most of my fellow countrymen and women are desperately in love with technology. And I think this is a mistake. And so I think th the culture needs people who point out that their love is misplaced because you know when you're desperately in love with someone it's almost impossible to see what their failings are. Isn't that usually the case? You need someone who has a little distance from it and says, you know, haven't you noticed this guy kicks you every time he comes <laughs> on a date? You say, yeah, but ma, he says he loves me, you know. Uh, and so you need someone who says, look, technology is as much problematic for a culture as it is glorious. And we have to give some attention to the problematic part of it. And I'll end by saying that, I, believe it or not, I'm really quite optimistic um, uh, about all this. Uh, when I was being introduced as Neil Simon, you'll remember, uh, it, uh, Tucky said that, uh, read something that I wrote where uh, it said, uh, I don't know, 15 years ago, you really couldn't draw a crowd for a talk about this subject. You could get a bigger crowd if the lecture was on how to improve your backhand in tennis than on this subject. All of that is changed. And I think that Americans are beginning to ask uh, some of the questions that I spoke of. I mean, they're wondering, are, are the kids watching too much television? What the hell has television done to them? Even asking questions about Sesame Street, which I think has been a national catastrophe and always, and, if, and I, I, any book I ever write, if I could find an occasion to say something snotty about Sesame Street, I love it. Um, but I mean, Americans are asking questions about this. What, what has it done to our family life, our social relations, our political ideas? They're beginning to ask questions about uh, computer technology as well. So I, I'm very encouraged by this, and I think uh, we're, uh, there's so much vitality and intelligence in American culture that um, uh, I, I'm truly optimistic about the possibility of our giving some order and reason to the way we um, make use of the technologies. Um, the, the people in Europe, you know, they look across the Atlantic to see how we're doing. And up until very recently, they thought America was the largest open-air insane asylum in the world. 
But now their views are quite different because Americans are getting together and actually having a sensible conversations about this. Anyway, thank you very much. I enjoyed every minute of it. Thank you. Dr. Postman will be uh, signing copies of his books in the lobby in just a few minutes, and they're for sale out there. And we thank you very much for coming.